Okay, the reading for this week is a series of short works by the great uh, 20th century Japanese writer and uh, comedian. I think it's always important to remember that he's a comedian, Dazai Osama. And the work is uh, called Haji in the original title, translated by Lane Dunlop as Shame. And Lane Dunlop's translation came out in 1992. I'll provide the uh, link to that, to her translation, in the description below, and a link to the original Japanese below as well. Uh, it's available through on, online at uh, Aozora Bunko, Aozora Bunko. Uh, Dazai Osama's Shame, it's a very short work, so I'm going to read the whole thing. Before I read it, though, I want to um, give you seven things to think about as we read it. Okay, so this is a study guide, uh, just very briefly. Seven things that we want to think about and uh, answer um, in our homework assignments later. For number one, Dazai is a comedian. Okay, it's always important to remember that he's a comedian first. He's a kind of Andy Kaufman figure. Even when he's killing himself at the end of his life and uh, trying to commit suicide over and over again and failing and doing it again, he's still a comedian, right? And he ultimately commits the greatest comic act of all to kill oneself. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so remember that, that his works are kind of performances. They're not just simply straightforward uh, confessions of his own struggles and pain and so forth in a dark and morose mode. They're ironic, always, so always read them as ironic self-portraits, okay, but from different angles. So we read already in this class Hashire Meros, which took a uh, poem by the German romantic poet Schiller and transformed it into a, uh, his own sort of prose work that emphasized his own themes that he talks about in all of his works. Uh, so even that work, which doesn't have anybody named Dazai Osama in it or any Japanese characters even in it, and there's no Japanese setting in it, it takes place in ancient Greece, you'll remember. Uh, it's still kind of a, an ironic self-portrait. <clears throat> so all of his words can be read in this ironic self-portrait mode even when they are super fictionalized. Okay, so it's also important not to confuse the mask with the man. Okay, Tazai Osama, and that's sort of the point of this short work here, that the mask is not the man, or is it? So there's kind of ambiguity. Is the mask the man, or is it not? Um, he plays with this uh, ambiguity in all of his works, and in this work as well. So number, the question number two here is, who is the mask the alter ego. So in this work, uh, the alter ego is named Mr. Toda, right? who's an author, like uh, Dazai Osama is an author in real life, seems to resemble the author, but is this, we should not confuse the mask of the alter ego, ego with Dazai Osama, it's himself, right? So uh, in his works, in all of Dazai Osama's works, the name of the author of the alter ego, the circumstances of the alter ego, may change, but they are usually emphasize the same themes, and these characters, these alter egos, have the same qualities, right? So it's important to note that most of these male characters are basically the same in all of his works, right? Even if they're not Dazai Osama himself, this alter ego that he's created, he repeats them in many of his works. And who is this guy? Usually, uh, he's a middle-aged male, a writer. He has masochistic qualities, right? So he, uh, um, and the women sense this, right? He's dissolute. He's unhappy. He's usually from a good birth, a uh, good family, but uh, is now poor, which uh, corresponds to Tazai's own life, right? He's born in Aomori Prefecture to a very good family, but he uh, chooses the wild life, and his family rejects him and disowns him and so forth, so he's now in poverty, even though he's born in uh, wealth up in the northern parts of Japan. Um, so you see some overlap here with his alter egos and his works. He's self-pitying, but in a kind of self-conscious way, right? He uses... Self-pity to bed the girls, right? Uh, and he's usually very lovable. The women usually uh, fall in love with him. Uh, he's unscrupulous but sensitive. So he's got this kind of dual nature. He's a, a bad boy, but he also has a very, very sensitive t side. He's feckless, but he's also also has a deep understanding of female psychology and the, the nature and structure of female desire and so forth. And he's a lover boy with many lovers. Uh, a lot of them are sort of lower class girls who work in bars and so forth. And in real life, too, he would eventually uh, marry several of them, have kids with several of them, and commit Shinju with several of them, ultimately uh, succeeding in his last attempt to kill himself. And he died alongside his lover at the time. Uh, he's kind of a beautiful soul, to use Hegel's phrase. Right? He's too pure for this dirty, filthy world. But he's uh, kind of aware of this fact that he's not so pure himself. So there's irony in that as well. All right. And so the question here for number two is describe the character Mr. Toda in this work. 
Okay, and I, I say describe the characters, Mr. Toda, because there's really essentially two Todas in this work. There's Mr. Toda as he exists in the mind of this girl, who sort of fantasizes about what he is uh, from reading his novels. And then there's Mr. Toda in real life, whom she meets when she goes to visit him. Okay, number four, uh, number three rather. Question number three, describe the girl, the main uh, character, the female character, and the narrator of this work. She's a 23-year-old girl, a kind of hako iri musume type. That's the Japanese word you want to look up, hako iri musume. A girl is kind of sheltered from the world by her family. They raise her in a box to keep her naive and pure and so forth. Uh, what is her personality? Uh, describe her looks, her f class, her family background. So she's kind of from an upper class family or higher bourgeois family, it seems. She go used to go skiing in her youth. Uh, we're in the middle of the war, though, so things aren't as... Uh, she's, her family isn't as wealthy and free to do as they please as they once were, but you can tell that she's from an upper class family, I think. Um, her personality, we see her personality from the first letter that she sends to him. So describe her personality as we see it there, and uh, throughout the course of the, her narrative, how is her personality revealed? Um, why does she start by saying that she has been shamed or humiliated? Okay, so that's how the work, and we find out, of course, what she's referring to by the end of the story. Uh, explain the significance of this passage at the end. And here's the Japanese, I don't have the English at hand, but we'll look that up later. But find the Japanese passage toward the end that says, uh, where she comments about how shōsetsuka writers are all na na liars. Shōsetsuka wa akuma da, usotsuki da. Hinbo demo nai no ni gokuhi no furi o shiteru. Lippa na kao shiteru kuse ni shūbō da nante yutte dōjō o atsumeteru. Un to benkyō shiteru kuse ni mugaku da nante yutte toboketeru. Okusama wo ai shiteru kuse ni mainichi fufu genka da to fuichō shiteru. Kurushuku mo nai no ni this is the kind of the uh, climactic passage of the work, so explain its significance in this question number three. Question number four, uh, the work, of course, is in the epistolary form. Uh, it consists of letters and letters within letters. It's uh, The basic structure is a letter to her friend explaining her situation and how she's been shamed. And then within that we have excerpts from other letters that uh, she received and that she sent to the writer. So explain this epistolary structure, which of course is used in uh, the his great masterpiece that is kind of similar to this work, Jose To. And there's a translation of that into English, uh, The School Girl, I think it's called. Um, very moving work, and it kind of draws from uh, Dazai's own letter, epistolary correspondence with a young female fan, and he developed in that, that into a whole novel. So that, that novel is kind of an earlier form of this, actually. this That was written in 1939, I think, originally, and this was in 1942, published in January 42, at the height of the war, and they were both included in his uh, collection of stories published in for 1942 and June of 42, called Jose. All right, so there's some overlap between those. If we have time in this during the semester, we'll read that fuller work. It's a longer work, maybe 120 pages or so, called Jose To, or the Schoolgirl in the English translation. Um, okay, so explain this structure. Question number five: Note how Kazuko, the young girl, 23-year-old girl, reads all of Toda's works in the autobiographical mode. Okay, the I novel mode underline this word, the autobiographical mode, which is, of course, Mr. Toda's and Dazai Osama's intention. All right, They want their readers to read it in the autobiographical mode, even though they know that the autobi that, that what they are writing is not, in fact, autobiograph autobiography. Okay, so note the gap or the disjunction or the disparity between the naive Kazuko's image of Mr. Toda that she has in her mind when she's initially writing to him, and Mr. Toda in real life, whom she meets in real life at his clean, well-kept suburban home. Okay, so there's a great gap between the two, and it shocks her, and she's kind of traumatized by the experience. What is Dazai trying to convey about the nature of art, of literature, of fiction, of fabrication, of the idea of masks? We all wear masks, right? What is he trying to say uh, in this work? What is its sort of philosophical or literary or aesthetic message that he's trying to convey. Is he trying to say that uh, I am not my mask? Or is he saying that I, inf I um, am my mask in some ways? 
So consider this notion of autobiography, of performance, of fabrication, and this idea of masks. And the final question, where is the war in this story? This is written in late 1941, so uh, it's Pearl Harbor has already happened. Uh, Japan is now at war not only with China, but also with the United States. And we're at the height of the war, but we don't see any uh, hints of the war in this work. Why not? What does uh, that absence reveal about the character uh, Kazuko? Okay, so these are the six questions. I said seven in the beginning, but there are only six that I want you to think about as I recite this work. Okay, so now I'm going to read it in full uh, in the voice of Kazuko, the female character and narrator. Dazai Osama, shame. <clears throat> Kikuko-san, so she's writing to her friend Kikuko, Kikuko-san. Kikuko-san, I've been shamed. I've been terribly shamed. Figures of speech such as my face is on fire don't begin to describe it. Even if I told you I wanted to roll around on the ground and scream, that still wouldn't cover it. I feel like that younger sister Tamar in the second book of Samuel in the Bible. And Tamar put ashes on her head and rent her garments of divers colors that were on her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. Poor, poor Tamar. When a young woman has been unbearably shamed, she truly does want to pour ashes over her head and wail. I understand how Tamar felt. Kikuko sang. It is just as you said, after all. Writers are human trash. No, they're devils. They're awful. I've been greatly shamed. Kikuko sang. I haven't told you about it up to now, but I secretly sent a letter to that writer, Mr. Toda. And finally I went to see him, to my everlasting shame. What a sordid affair. I'll tell you everything from the beginning. Early in September, I sent the following letter to Mr. Toda. It's an extremely affected letter. Okay, then she includes her, uh, the letter that she sent him. Uh, the first letter that she sent him. Dear Sir, please forgive me. Although I know it isn't sensitive of, sensible of me, I've taken the liberty of writing to you. I realize that you probably haven't had a single female reader up until up to now. Women only read books that have been widely advertised. Women have no taste of their own. Saying to themselves, other people are reading it, so I'll read it. They read out of a spirit of empty vainglory. They feel a sort of desperate respect for anyone who shows off their learning. They're completely overawed by trivial reasoning. You, sir, if, you're, if you'll pardon my saying so, don't know the meaning of the word. You seem to have no education. I began reading your work last summer, and I believe I've read nearly everything you've written by now. That's why, without ever having met you, I know all about you. Your circumstances, your looks, and your demeanor. She thinks she knows him by uh, reading all of his novels. Obviously, she finds out when she actually meets him that she does not know him at all and that he's, in fact, been uh, wearing a mask in his fiction. Uh, just, you're, I know all about you, your, your circumstances, your looks, and your demeanor. I've thought to myself, such, surely such a writer doesn't have a single female reader. You reveal everything without in the, in the least dressing it up. Your poverty, your stinginess... Your squalid quarrels with your wife, your ignominious illnesses, your extreme physical ugliness, your slovenly attire, the way you nibble on ox octopus legs as you swill your cheap potato-based sake, the way you run wild all over Tokyo and sleep on the bare floor, your constantly being in debt, and all the other dirty, discredi discreditable facts of your life. It won't do. Women instinctively honor cleanliness. Reading your stories, even though I felt a, a little sorry for you, when I read what you've written about yourself, how you've gotten a bald spot, how your teeth are falling out, it was just too much. I smiled out of embarrassment for you. Please forgive me. You really are rather contemptible. What's more, haven't you gone to women who are the lowest of the low, in unmentionably filthy dives? That was the last straw. Even I read those parts holding my nose. Even I read those parts holding my nose. Women readers, without exception, must look down on you and be shocked by you. It's only natural, natural they should. I read, I read your stories in secret from my friends. If they found out I was reading you, probably I would be laughed at, have my character called into question and be ostracized. Please think about yourself a little. For my part, while recognizing your numberless defects, your lack of education, your inferior literary style, your ignoble character 
the inadequacy of your thought, your mud muddle-headedness, I have discovered at the heart of your work a single solitary streak of pathos. I treasure that pathos. Other women wouldn't understand. As I've said before, women read only to flatter themselves. They like to read about terribly refined love affairs at summer resorts or else intellectual novels. But I thought that that pathos, if that's what it is, at the bottom of your stories was precious. Please, sir, don't despair over your bad looks, your past sins, your poor style. Concentrate on that feeling of pathos which is unique to you. At the same time, take better care of your health and read up a little on philosophy and language. So she's trying to enlighten him by uh, introducing him to philosophy and language. Deepen your thought. If, in the future, the pathos in your work were placed in a philosophical framework, your stories would be sneered at, wouldn't be sneered at as they are now. She's trying to improve him. And your character would be improved. When you are a better person, that's the day I'll remove my mask. I am thinking I would like to tell you my name and address and come to meet you. At present, however, I'll limit myself to encouraging you from a distance. I think I should make it clear that this is not a fan letter. I'll ask you not to display the letter to your wife, with some vulgar joke about how even you have a woman fan. I have my pride. Okay, so the supreme irony of this work is that she uh, says to him in this first letter, when you are a better person, that's the day I'll remove my mask. And of course the irony is that she is not masked here, uh, whereas he, uh, as he appears in his fiction that she has read, is masked, right? So she's getting it all wrong. Okay. So that's the end of the letter, and then she continues in her letter, to, that's the end of the embedded letter, and then she continues her letter to her friend Kikuko-san. Kikuko-san, that in general is what I wrote in my letter. My addressing him as Sir seems somehow stilted, but I just couldn't use anything more intimate. Mr. Toda and I are too far apart in age, and anyway it would be too familiar. If Mr. Toda forgot his age and flattered himself with strange ideas about me, it would be awkward. I didn't have sufficient respect for him to call him master. Also, since he has no education, of course he is very educated, she finds this out later, since he has no education, it would be completely unnatural to call him that, as if he were a great teacher. That's why I decided to call him sir. But even sir sounds a little strange. Even so, even after I mailed the letter, I felt no pangs of conscience. I've done a good thing, I thought. It's a good feeling to lend even a little one, a little of one's strength to such a sad person. And the irony, of course, is that he's not sad at all. He has a very normal, healthy relationship with his wife. He's happy. He lives in a fair uh, comfort in the suburbs. But in this letter, I gave neither my name nor address. I was afraid to. If he came to my house drunk and in dirty clothes, how startled and frightened my mother would be. He might threaten me, demand money. Since he was a per person of defective character, there's, there was no telling what he might do. I wanted to remain the eternal masked woman. But, Kik but Kikuko-san, it was no good. It turned into something awful. Before a month passed, circumstances arose where I, whereby I just had to write to Mr. Toda a second time. What's more, this time I clearly stated my name and address. Kikuko-san, I am a girl to be pitied. When I give you the contents of this second letter, you will have a pretty good idea of the circumstances. I will insert it here. Please don't laugh. Okay, so here is the second letter that she writes to Mr. Toda. Mr. Dear Mr. Toda, I was amazed. How on earth were you able to describe me so exactly? You were right. My name really is Kazuko, and I am 23 years old, the daughter of a teacher. I've been neatly and completely exposed. When I read your story in this month's literary world, the journal, Bungakai, I was absolutely flabbergasted. Really and truly, there's no pulling the, world, the wool over the eyes of a writer, I thought to myself. How did you know? You saw so clear through my feelings. So she thinks he uh, sees her and uh, has been able to write her true self and her uh, deep emo deepest emotions and so forth, but he's... Um, obviously describing somebody else in the work, in the uh, piece that was published in the Bungakai. How did you know? You saw clear through my feelings. One line in particular pierced my heart like a poison-tipped arrow. 
And it seems that Dazai Osama's point here is to say that uh, if you understand women in general, universal women as such, sort of, you understand all the particular women and they will each think that uh, you have understood them on an individual basis, where in fact you just understand women uh, in the general sense. I think it's the sort of joke behind this. One line in particular pierced my heart like a poison-tipped arrow. And then she quotes from his recent work. She even began to have lewd fantasies. When I read that, I thought to myself that you certainly had taken a marvelous stride forward. It made me very happy to feel that my anonymous letter had instantly aroused in you the desire to create a work of literature. I never even dreamt that one woman's support could inspire a writer in this m remarkable way. According to what I've heard, though, even great writers like Balzac and Hugo produced numerous masterpieces thanks to a woman's protection and power of consolation. I've made up my mind to help you in whatever humble way I can. Please be strong and persevere. I'll write to you from time to time. In your most recent story, your analysis of female psychology, although shallow, is a true advance. There are passages which are really quite splendid. I was impressed. But there are still parts which are unsatisfactory. I am a young woman, so from here on I'll instruct you in the ways of a woman's heart. And the irony, of course, is that Dazai Osama and Mr. Toda probably know a woman's heart better than she knows a woman's heart and knows herself. It is my belief that you are a man of great promise. I believe that your stories also will gradually improve. Please, good, uh, please read good books and steep yourself in philosophical culture. If your culture is deficient, you will never become a great writer. If something painful happens, please don't hesitate to write to me. Since I've already been found out, I will take off my mask. My name and address are as I've written them on the outside of the envelope. It's not a pseudonym, so please don't worry. I will assured, assuredly meet, want to meet you on that happy day when, you're perfect, when you've perfected your moral development. But until then, I will only correspond with you. Please be patient. I was genuinely astonished. Bef because you even knew my name. I have an idea that you I have an idea that you were very excited about my letter and showed it to all your friends and then with the postmark as a clue you asked a friend at a newspaper and finally ascertained my name. The irony of course is that he doesn't look into her, he doesn't really care about her. She's just one of his many fans uh, and that the story he wrote probably has nothing to do with her. Am I mistaken? Men always get excited when they get a, a letter from a woman. I don't like it. How did you know my name and even my age, 23? Please write to me and tell me. We'll have a long correspondence. From now on, I'll be more gentle and womanly in my letters. Please take care of yourself. Okay, that's the end of the second letter she writes to him. And then she continues her letter to her friend, Kikuko-san. Kikuko-san! While copying out this letter, I burst into tears again and again. I felt as if my whole body had broken out in a greasy sweat. Please try to understand my feelings. I was wrong. He wasn't writing about me at all. It had nothing to do with me. Ah, the shame of it. The shame. Kikuko-san, please sympathize with me. I'll tell you the rest of the story, right to the bitter end. Have you read the story, The Seven Flowers of Autumn, which Mr. Toda published in this month's issue of Literary World? It's about a 23-year-old girl who's excessively afraid of love, who despises sexual ecstasy, and finally marries a rich old man of 60. She comes to hate even that, and ends up committing suicide. It's a little bit gloomy in, it, in its explicitness, but Mr. Toda's special quality comes out in it. Reading the story, I thought that I was clearly the model for the girl. For some reason, I thought that as soon as I'd read a few lines, I immediately turned pale. Wasn't the girl's name even the same as mine, Kazuko? Wasn't the age the same, 23? Even the fact that the girl's father taught at university was exactly the same. It's true that otherwise the girl's life was completely different from mine, but I still somehow thought that Mr. Toda had gotten the idea for, for the story from my letter. That was the source of my humiliation. Four or five days later I received a postcard from Mr. Toda. Its message was as follows. And then she, re she recites the uh, message that she receives from Mr. Toda. Dear Madame, thank you for your letter. I am grateful for your support. I also read with interest your previous letter. I have never to this day done such a rude thing as show another person's letter to the members of my household for laughs. 
I have never shown anybody's letters, letter to my friends and gotten all excited about it. Please set your mind at rest on that score. Furthermore, you say that you will kindly meet me when I have perfected my moral development. But can any human being perfect his character all by himself? Very sincerely yours. Okay, so the response is very professional, very kind of uh, cold and distant almost, right? There's no sense of intimacy uh, between uh, that he feels for the, his young fan. Writers certainly, and then she can end letter, she continues her letter to her friend. Writers certainly know how to say things gracefully, I thought to myself. I've been made a fool of. I felt mortified. All that day I was in a daze. Then the next morning I suddenly wanted to meet Mr. Toda. I had to meet him. That person was surely unhappy as he, as he was now. Unless I went to see him, he might end up doing, going to the bad. That man was waiting for me to come to him. The irony, of course, is that he's not at all unhappy and he's not at all waiting for him, waiting for her to visit him. Uh, I would go to him. Hurriedly, I got myself ready. Kikoko-san, do you think that when one goes to visit a poverty-stricken writer in a tenement, one should wear expensive clothes? Surely one should not. Do you remember that incident when the committee from some ladies' organization went on a tour of the slum, slums in their fox fur boas? One has to be careful. According to his stories, Mr. Toda did not even possess a single kimono. So once you, again, she's conflating Mr. Toda, uh, the character of his stories, with Mr. Toda himself. He had to go around in an old dressing gown with the cotton padding coming out. And the tatami mats in his house were coming apart, so that he had to spread newspapers all over the room and sit on them. If I visited such a household in the pink dress which I'd recently had made, it would be very rude and mischievous. I would just make them feel lonely and ashamed in their poverty. I put on a much mended skirt from my school days and then a yellow windbreaker from when I used to go skiing. The windbreaker was already too small, much too small for me. My ar arms stuck out of the sleeves almost back to my elbows. The openings of the sleeves were tattered with raveled threads hanging down. I didn't think it would hurt anyone's feelings. I also knew from Mr. Toda's stories that every year when autumn came, he suffered from Betty Betty, Berry Berry. So I uh, decided to take him the blanket off my bed. I folded it up in a furoshiki. I thought I'd advise him to wrap his legs in the wool blanket and do his work. Without telling my mother, I sneaked out the back door. As you know, Kikuko-san, I have one gold tooth in front which is removable. So on the trolley, I stealthily took it out, deliberately making myself look ugly. Mr. Toda probably had several teeth missing, so to not make him feel ashamed of himself, to put him at ease, I wanted to show him that my teeth were bad too. I messed up my hair too. I became an extremely ugly, indigent hag. One has to be extraordinarily careful and considerate in order to console a weak, ignorant, poverty-stricken person. Mr. Toda's house was in the suburbs. When I got off the government runway, uh, government railway train, I asked for directions at the policeman's booth. The house was not hard to find. Kikuko-san, it was not a tenement. It was a small house, but with its own gate and a neat, well-cared-for air. The garden, too, was beautifully tended. The autumn roses were all in bloom. I was surprised by everything. When I slid open the door of the entryway, there were some chrysanthemums arranged in a bowl on top of the sandal box. A calm, refined lady came out to greet me. I thought I had mistaken the house. Is this where Mr. Toda, the writer, lives? I asked timidly. Yes, it is, the lady answered. I was dazzled by her gentle smile. Is the master... The word master slipped out despite myself. Is the master at home? I was shown into the lit master's study. A man with a serious face was sitting upright at the writing table. He wasn't wearing an old padded dressing gown. I don't know what kind of material it was, but he wore a thick, lined, dark blue kimono and a stiff obi with a single white stripe on the black 
background, on a black background. The study gave me the feeling of a parlor, where one might have tea. In the ornamental alcove, there was a hanging scroll of Chinese poetry. I couldn't read a single character of the calligraphy. In a bamboo basket, an ivy plant had been beautifully trained. Beside the writing table, a great many books were piled high in several stacks. Okay, so it's becoming clear to her that she's not the enlightened, educated, cultured one who is, would be able to uh, enlighten him with her learning and so forth. In fact, it's the other way around, right? She, he has Chinese scroll on the wall with a Chinese character that she's unable to read. He has all kinds of books lying about that she's definitely never read. So uh, the irony is intensifying. I'd been wrong about everything, she continues. None of his teeth were missing. He wasn't going bald. His features were clean cut and regular. Nowhere was there anything slovenly about his appearance. I was baffled. How could this person drink rot gut sake and sleep on a dirt floor? Recovering my courage, I said, I get a completely different feeling from your stories and from meeting you. Oh, is that so? He replied casually. He didn't seem very interested in me. How did you know about me? That's what I came to ask you about, I said, trying to put things back on a formal basis. What do you mean? My question got no rise out of him whatsoever. Although I concealed both my name and address, didn't you see through it, Master? In that letter I wrote you, in that letter I wrote you, it was the first thing I asked about. I don't know anything about you. It's strange. With clear eyes, he looked straight at me and smiled slightly. What? I began to feel panic-stricken. But if that's so, if you didn't understand the meaning of my letter, it was very bad of you not to say anything. You must have thought me a fool. I wanted to burst into tears. What a silly, arbitrary decision I'd made on my own. What a mess, what a mess. Kikuko-san, my face was on fire. Words just can't describe it. I wanted to throw myself down in a grassy field, roll around and scream, Wah! Even saying that isn't enough. Please give my letters back to me then. I feel unbearably shamed. Please give them back. With a grave expression, Mr. Todat nodded. Perhaps he was angry. What an awful person, he must have been thinking. I'll look for them. I don't keep every single letter I get every day. They may already be gone. I'll ask my family to look later. If we look, if we find them, we'll send them to you. Did you say there were two? There were two. Oh, I felt miserable. You say that my so stories somehow resemble your life. But I never use real models in my stories. They're pure fiction. To begin with, that first letter you sent me. Suddenly falling silent, he lowered his eyes. I've been extremely rude. I was a pathetic slum girl with one of her teeth missing. My jacket was too small for me, and the openings of the sleeves were tattered. My navy blue schoolgirl skirt was all patched and darned. From the top of my head to the tips of my toes, I was bathed in humiliation. Writers are demons. They're liars. Although they're not poor, they pretend to be in the depths of poverty. Although they're very handsome, they play on your sympathy by saying they're ugly. And this is the uh, quotation, the passage that I mentioned in question six, I think it was, of, this, of the study guide notes that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Although they study very hard, they play the fool, pretending to be ignorant. Although they love their wife, they claim they have quarrels every day. Although they're suffering no hardship, they make as if their life were a veil of tears. I was deceived. Silently bowing my head to Mr. Toda, I got to my feet. How is your illness? I read in your stories about your having beriberi. I'm in good health, thank you. I had brought the blanket off my bed for this person. Now I had to take it back. Kikuko-san, on my way home, carrying the bundle of, wool bl of my wool blanket, I wept for shame. Burying my face in the blanket, I wept and wept. I, I was cursed at by drivers. You fool, watch where you're going, they said to me, the drivers. Two or three days later, those two letters of mine in a big envelope were delivered by registered mail. I still harbored a faint ray of hope. Surely, from the master, there would be a word of comfort to rescue me from my humiliation. Wouldn't there be, in this bulky envelope, along with my two letters, a gentle letter of consolation from the master? 
Holding the envelope to my bosom, I prayed for this. Then I opened it. There was nothing. Aside from my two letters, there was nothing. Thinking that perhaps on the back of one of the pages of my letters he, he had scribbled some passing thought, I looked carefully at the back and front of every single sheet of stationery, but nothing was written on them. This shame of mine. Do you understand, Kikuko-san? I wanted to pour ashes over my head. I aged ten years that day. Writers are beneath contempt. They're human trash. Everything they write is lies. They're not in the least bit romantic. Ensconced in their ordinary comfortable households with cold disdain for a girl in shabby clothes with a front tooth missing, not even seeing her to the door, eternally calm as if they were as if it were none of their affair, they're terrifying. I wonder if they aren't the biggest frauds in the world. Alright, this is the end of this work. This work is a, definitely a masterpiece, perfectly constructed. Every detail uh, is there for a reason and fits perfectly with the whole. And Lane Dunlap's translation, too, uh, like all of her translations, is a master translation. Alright, that is the end of this work. Uh, answer the study guide questions that I mentioned at the big, beginning of this video and submit them at the end of this class. That is all for now. We will do several other short works by the great Dazai Osama in this class uh, uh, next week. Alright, if you have any questions, send me an email. That is all for now. Goodbye.